This video is a continuation of last week's video where I shared my job hunting process so far. Last video I talked about 8 job interviews that I had, what they asked me and why it did or didn't work out. Stay tuned till the end of the video where I share a technical interview that I did with Apple. Anyways, we left off with interview number 8 which was with a recruiter for a mechanical design engineering position at a smart home startup in the Bay Area. The recruiter told me the hiring process was made up of 5 steps, call with the recruiter, interview with hiring manager, interview with engineering manager number 1, interview with engineering manager number 2, and an on-site interview with the team and the CEO. I had passed the first stage and she had scheduled me to do the second stage which was an interview with the hiring manager on December 20th. That would be interview number 9 since I lost my job and here's how it went. And it was actually quite a unique interview with the hiring manager. And that's because you wanted to treat this interview like a conversation where he asked me a question, I give him an answer, then I ask him a question and he gives me an answer. First question he asked me was obviously, tell me about yourself. I get to graduate with 2 years of work experience from internships because the University of Waterloo how it works is like a 5 year program. Do four, you're familiar with it? Yeah, so you do 4 year school and you alternate. Yeah. And before that, I was at Tesla, also as a mechanical design engineer. And I gave him the regular summary of my experiences I always give. Next question he asked me is, how do you see your career progressing? I just like working on really well mechanically designed parts. But I'm not too specific on a particular like industry. I worked at Ecobee in, as one of my internships in the past. So I then asked him to explain the hardware team dynamic at the company and he talks about it for a few minutes. Afterwards, he jumps into the third question of the interview. He says, let's say we have a thermal mechanical product with an electrical component and current. We collect data about current over time and we need to convert it to temperature over time. How would you do that? Before solving it, I first ask him, Are you looking for more of a like an intuitive answer or like a mathematical he says, use your intuition. So I start off by saying, when you have current moving through the resistor, it will be sort of heat that's going to be dissipated, will cause a change in temperature over you know a particular time period. He then asked if the power dissipated was one watt, how would you find the temperature change over time? So I say, if power dissipated was one watt. The first sort of, I mean, if you're looking for numbers, first equation that come to mind is like, Q equals MC delta T. He then asked me, what does that equation represent? So I say, based on like the mass of the part and then the specific heat, and then, you know, the change in temperature, you can determine how much power has either been like le left the system or entered the system. He's like, great, exactly. Now, mathematically, if you have current, how would you find power? So I share my screen to explain my answer. Here's what I say. If we have a resistor with current moving through it, the amount of power dissipated would be governed by this equation, P equals I squared over R. Once we have power, we can assume it heats up the resistor and its surroundings. Defined by how much, we can use Q equals MC delta T. If we know mass and specific heat and we just found power, we can isolate for the change in temperature. Which would answer your question of how to find the change in temperature based on an input current. He was like, yep, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And he goes off to ask me another technical question. It goes like this. If we have an electronic enclosure, what are some ways to cool it? So I say, sort of forced convection where maybe have a fan or something blow air across this to allow it to cool down. Potentially designing fins. I'm guessing if it's an enclosure, that's something that could work well as, uh, as well because that kind of allows for better heat dissipation because it's kind of, you know, you have a greater surface area for where you can dis sort of distribute heat. So you want to have, you know, a greater convective sort of heat coefficient. And so you can do that by altering the material. He's like, yep, those are great answers, but there's one thing you're missing which is kind of cheating, but if you reduce the power produced by the electronics in the enclosure, that technically cools down the system. So I kind of laugh at that because I obviously assume that you can't change how much power is being outputted by the electronics to cool it down. Afterwards, I ask him. So I'm curious to know like what the hardware space or like because I have a hardware shop or hardware lab like, and what the work environment is like at the office. He then gives me an answer and then asks me my final technical question. It went like this. Let's say we have part A and part B and this is what they look like. You want to attach a part between them what are some things do you have to consider so i say part a part b and you want to attach a part in between them first thing i look at is where the, what's the size of part a and part b and the part that i want to attach uh you know what, what material is part a and part b made out of fasting features so you know are there any holes on part a or part b uh can we make holes if there aren't any by the way here what i'm looking at is my notebook 
I have a notebook where I'm drawing diagrams and jotting down the technical questions that they ask me so I can keep track of how I answered them. He likes the answer and ends the interview by saying he'll have the recruiter schedule the next interview, which was pretty exciting. I had it scheduled for January 3rd. Now before getting to that, I had an interview with another startup in the healthcare industry on December 21st. The interviewer joins a bit late, so I was just waiting for him. Once the interview starts, he asked me to tell him a bit about myself, so I do. So you know, with that two year internship experience, I was able to first get a job right out of university working at, a, working at Tesla, <laughs> catting on Katia, creating engineering drawings, sharing it with Asian vendors, also involved a lot of prototyping work as well. I talked for like three or four minutes. Now the interview was only 30 minutes long, but it was an odd one because he then goes off and talks straight for like 20 minutes about himself, his background and what the company does. Finally, in the last five minutes, he asked me two questions. First, what are you looking for next in your career? Second, which was a bit of an odd one for a technical engineering interview, but he says, So you're on your deathbed, you're looking back over your life, what do you want to say about your career? And of course, your career is just one part of your total life. I was a bit thrown off at first, but I answered by saying something along the lines of, I think for, for me, um, how many people have I impacted positively throughout my life? But that's it. He just asks me these three technical questions that were very high level and not technical at all, which was quite surprising since he had an engineering background. But a few days go by and he sends this email saying they're not interested in moving forward with me. Sometimes I have an idea why, but for this one, I genuinely had no idea. Moving on, interview 11 was with the smart home startup, and this was my third stage of their interview process. Hey, how's it going? He started off by telling me about his team and what they specifically do in the company. He then asked me, what do I enjoy doing in my day-to-day -day work? So I say, Look for is like working on like well mechanical design parts in like a tech key kind of niche. It's sort of like a what I kind of enjoy doing. He then asks, how do I go about making parts? As in what process do I follow? So I say, So I'm getting to go through the entire like sort of product development process. He <laughs> starts sketching some ideas, he turns those sketches into CAD. <laughs> you create engineering drawings, use gd &T, go back and forth to suppliers to sort of, you know, send them the right drawing that they're happy with that they can actually manufacture. He seemed to like that answer. And that was the first 15 minutes of the interview. For the remaining 45 minutes, he shares his screen and we go through this engineering design problem together. This is what it looked like. We have a motorcycle and we can represent it with this diagram that only contains a battery and a motor. The motor is 300 millimeters in diameter and 300 millimeters long. The dark orange portion of the motor releases 500 watts of heat. What would you do to keep this motor cool? That was a relatively straightforward question because if you remember, I got asked a very similar question in a previous interview that I had. I start off by giving a pretty basic overview of different methods of heat transfer. Well, I mean, to talk about how to cool it, you gotta look at the different methods of heat transfer. <laughs> I uh, will also keep in mind that there is a battery which is like a, a heat source as well right there. Then I mentioned how we can use the convective heat transfer equation to cool down this part. We can change H by controlling the material and A by increasing the surface area and adding fins. We can also liquid cool, air cool or add fans. He then asks me to sketch out a design concept. So I do that and it was a bit hard to draw with a trackpad but I figure it out. He then asks if this was made out of plastic for high volume manufacturing, how would you go about making it? I say injection molding. He then asks, would I make any design changes if I were to go with that manufacturing process? So I said yes, and I talked about how we can avoid some classic injection molding defects like sinking, warping, drag marks, etc. I then end off the interview by asking him a few questions about the company and the team. Overall, I think the interview went well since I moved on to the next stage of the interview process. So now I'm on stage four out of five in the hiring process for this smart home startup. Now I'm starting to get a bit excited. Anyways, this next interview is about an hour long. Like most interviews, he asks me to tell him a bit about myself. So I say again, the exact same thing I say in almost every job interview. I went to Waterloo Engineering, graduated with two years of work experience. I then worked at Tesla and a tech startup after. He then asks me which manufacturing process am I most familiar with? And I say CNC machining and injection molding since that's what I did most in my previous work experience. So he asks me some questions about injection molding like what are some common defects? What are some design rules of thumb, how you design ribs when injection molding. I say the rib thickness should be between 50 to 60% of the wall thickness and rib height should not go over three times the wall thickness. I also mentioned how ribs should be angled slightly at about two degrees. So far I'm feeling confident about these manufacturing questions just 
hammering them out one by one. But after a while, he just keeps building on and asking me some pretty difficult advanced injection molding questions that I honestly couldn't answer. So I was honest, I said I can't answer that particular question as I didn't have much experience working on it in the past, but I'd love to learn. Keep in mind that this guy is about twice my age. So yeah, he has a lot more injection molding and mechanical engineering experience than I do. He said, yeah, don't worry about it, let's move on. But just based on the way he said it, it felt like this could be the reason for why I don't move forward. Anyways, we move on and he asks me the next technical question. He asks me to draw a stress strain curve for steel, aluminum, glass, and jello. So this is what I came up with. I labeled yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, and fracture strength. The jello kind of threw me off, but I just treated it like rubber. He says, yep, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And we move on to the final technical question. This is what it was. He says, let's say we have a large waterproof enclosure. If pressure on the inside and outside of the enclosure isn't equal, this could lead to permanent plastic deformation during shipment. What should we do to avoid that? It took me a while to get to the answer, but eventually I got it. And this is what I said. If we assume this gas is ideal, we can use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. By controlling the volume, moles, and temperature, we can control the pressure. He was like, yep, that's what I was looking for. I then asked him a few questions and the interview ended. Fast forward a couple days later, I get this email. They wanna move forward with someone else. And I figured it was probably because I messed up that injection molding question. But that was just a guess and the recruiter said we can hop on a call and she can give me some direct feedback. So I figured, why not? We did the call and just like expected, she said you were lacking a bit on your injection molding knowledge, so we had to move forward with someone else. She did say that the team still thought I was a strong candidate, but it just didn't work out. I was like, all right, fair enough. Looks like I need to study up some more on my injection molding knowledge. It just kind of sucked that after four stages of the interview process, I was so close to getting a job offer, but I slipped up. Anyways, can't dwell on it too long. The next interview I had was on January 13th for a product design engineering position at Apple. This was a technical interview with a fellow engineer. For some reason, they skipped the recruiter call stage of the interview. Again, she starts off by asking me to tell her a bit about myself. Do you mind walking me through your background? Yeah, for sure. I graduated in 2021 with a uh, mechanical engineering degree from the University of Waterloo. She then continued asking me some follow-up questions about my past work experience, like how I tested some of my previous designs. There's like a little pneumatic system and it just like lifts the cardboard and then drops it. And I continued to answer. This lasted for about 17 minutes before we jumped to some really technical questions. The first technical question she asked me was, Do you have a cantilever beam coming out of the a wall with a sign hanging at the end of the cantilever beam? So the sign right now is at the is at the farthest point from the wall. Um, can you give me as many ways as possible to reduce the deflection at the end of the game? I don't show it in the video, but I was hella excited to get that question because it's a classic mechanical engineering Apple interview question and I knew exactly how to answer it. Here's what I said. Whenever it comes to deflection and it's because it's a cantilever beam, the equation that kind of governs this, you know, real life application is Deflection equals FL cubed over 3EI, where F is force, L is the length from the cantilever beam to where the stop sign is, E is the Young's modulus, and I is the moment of inertia. And to reduce deflection, first thing we obviously do is reduce the force, which means reducing the mass of the stop sign, reducing its weight, uh, making it out of you know, lighter material. So that's like the first way, reducing the force. Second way, uh, reducing the length from which the stop sign is placed from the wall. The closer I bring it to the wall, um, the lower the deflection will be. Second thing I can do is increase the Young's modulus, uh, which means I can make it out of a stiffer material. For example, instead of using aluminum, I do steel. That would increase Young's modulus, which would reduce deflection. Another thing I can do is change the moment of inertia. And let's just assume like this cantilever beam has a square cross section. So with that, the moment of inertia equation is BH cubed over 12. If I increase the base or increase the height of that you know, square cross section that will increase the moment of inertia, which will reduce the flexion. Also, if I create it out of an I beam, for example, instead of a square, uh, uh, instead of a square cross section, that moves more of the mass kind of away from the center, which also helps increase the uh, moment of inertia, which will therefore reduce the flexion. But I answered that question so beautifully that she had no follow up questions. The second technical question she asked me was Walk me through the stress strain curve. Worthy and how they would compare. Another classic Apple interview question. So I answered it by saying, I wish I could draw it out, but um, so both. <laughs> Notice how I made her an Apple engineer laugh. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll draw steel first. So you have a nice linear slope, and that would be like the elastic deformation. And then you have like yield point phenomenon for a bit, and then you'd have, then it would be like a curve, 
and then it will max at a certain point and then come back down. Final point where it will fail will be like fracture strength. At the maximum point will be ultimate tensile strength. Then the point between elastic and plastic deformation will be the yield strength. The linear portion, the slope of that will be uh, Young's modulus, E, which is stress over strain. And then aluminum will be a little different. It's less stiff. It wouldn't have yield point phenomena. It'll just be like a linear line. And then it will start curving at the yield stress point. It's weaker than steel, so it'll have a yield, lower yield strength, lower ultimate tensile strength, and lower fracture strength. Because I'm drawing it out as I'm explaining it on my like notepad. But uh, yeah, I hope yeah. kind of that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think your explanation is pretty clear. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's pretty hard to describe a stress strength curve in film. Moving on, she asked me one final technical question. So if you're tasked to design the packaging for the next MacBook, not saying that we're releasing a MacBook that has a different display, yep. how would you go about starting the, defining the problem and what things would you consider? So I said... Okay, well, I mean, first thing, well, I can see what the purpose of this packaging is, but first I want to know the size of the MacBook, all the different parts that will go into this MacBook. So you have the charger, the actual MacBook, if there's, you know, all the manuals, anything like that. Figuring out however many parts there are, how big each part's going to be, so I can uh, get enough space for it. The material of the packaging is something else I'd have to consider as well. How this packaging will be manufactured is another important thing. It was pretty straightforward stuff and she seemed to like my answer. And that was it for the Apple interview. A week goes by and I don't hear back from them. So I just assumed they ghosted me and I completely forgot about them to be honest. Then on January 24th, I get this email. They said the interview went very well. I'm not gonna lie, I felt kinda gassed about that. They then sent a follow up email saying the next stage of the interview process would be a 7 day design challenge and the timer starts the day the challenge is sent over. So I reply back saying if they can send me the design challenge on the following Monday so I have that full week to work on it. I haven't done it yet but I'll keep you posted on how that goes. If you remember one of my previous videos I talked about how Apple rejected me 9 times over the past 5 years but who knows maybe this 10th time's the charm. That being said, so far to summarize. First, I interviewed with a farming startup, made it to the final round, then got rejected. Second, I interviewed with a robotics startup, made it to the second round, then got rejected. Third, I interviewed with a weed startup, but I rejected them since I'm not about it. Fourth, I interviewed with a company called Instrumental, and after the first round of interviews, they decided they don't want to hire anyone anymore. Fifth, I interviewed with a LiDAR startup, and they rejected me after the first round. Sixth, I interviewed with a smart home startup, made it to the fourth round, then got rejected. Seventh, I interviewed with Forward, and I got rejected after the first round. Eighth, I interviewed with Apple, I passed the first round, and I'm about to start working on the design challenge for them as part of the second round. Clearly, I'm still job hunting, so as I'm going through the process, I'll make a part three. It's honestly quite tough to keep going through rejections like this, but I just make myself believe that with time and discipline, the right role will come. And with every rejection, I'm always learning something new. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value, maybe taught you a thing or two about interviews. In the meantime, check out this interview where I share my experience interviewing with Apple as an engineer, or check out this video which is part one of my job hunting process. I'll see you in the next one. Peace! Thank you.